Yeah, it'll be back, yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I'll have time to do support vector machines today, so I will do that next class, and then it's not going to interfere with my schedule. I should be able to cover everything that I need to next class. Okay, so I'm just going to cover neural networks today. Okay, so um, when you're dealing with neural networks, there's a whole bunch of things that you have to consider. So here is, uh, from my experience, here's some advice I can impart onto you so that you're able to, you know, get this working properly. So when you're taking a look at neural networks, all we've done so far was just we took a look at uh, the output layer just having one neuron. So you can consider that as being binary classification, right? So for binary classification, we just, uh, let's see here, we just used a single neuron. at the output layer. Okay. And we threshold or we, you know, yeah, we threshold, that's the term. Threshold to tell us which class the input belongs to. Okay. So usually we let the uh, activation function be the sigmoid. So if it's the sigmoid, what you do is you threshold at the 0.5 mark. So if, you know, if it's a sigmoid, the output layer, if it's greater than 0.5, it's the positive class. And if it's less than 0.5, it's the negative class. Yeah, so this is for, you know, I'm doing multi-class now. <laughs> Okay, so for binary classification, we just used a single neuron, and then we took a look at what the output would be, and if you use the sigmoid, uh, you predict positive if the output's greater than 0.5 and negative if it's less than 0.5. Okay, so for multi-class, it's a little different. So for multi-class, it's, uh, it's actually a little different, but it's actually pretty easy to, to grasp. For multi-class, what you're doing is you do the same thing, you implement one versus all, just like we talked about before. Okay, you implement one versus all. So what's going to happen is that your upper layer, instead of it having just one neuron, it's going to have n neurons, where each neuron, or we have n neurons where n is the total amount of classes that you have. And each neuron is designed to detect, you know, it's designed to classify for one particular class of, of inputs. Okay, so the output layer has n neurons. Okay, so n is the total number of classes that we have. Okay, so to detect n classes. It's not a w, sorry, it's an n. Okay, and each neuron is designed to classify one class. Sorry. All right. Okay, so what you're doing here is that when you're taking a look at the expected output, you're going to have a vector of outputs. So every single output is going to be zero, except for the neuron that you, or the class that you want to detect. In that case, you set that neuron to one. Okay, so the expected output uh, has all neurons equal to zero, except for the class you want, uh, or the class, you know, you want to detect, or you want uh, to classify, I guess. Okay, so here's a quick example using four uh, classes, and I, I pulled this from uh, Andrew Ng's notes, pretty nice. So here's an example of four classes. Okay, so there are four layers. There's two hidden layers, one output layer, and one input layer. Okay, so each of these are designed to detect a particular, so the output of this would be for class one, this is for class two, class three, and class four. Okay, so what you're doing here is that, let's say you provide an input training example, okay? The expected output, if you would like it to, uh, if you want to detect it for each individual class, would be the following. So you would make it be a vector or one of one, zero, zero, zero. 
Okay? So what this is saying here is that when you provide the input, the expected output will be the first neuron being one and everything else being zero. So that's what the expected output would be. So this is for class one. Okay? If you wanted to do it for class two, everything is zero except for the second output. Okay? If you wanted to do it for the third class, zero, zero, one, zero, and then you can probably see where this is going. Okay? This is for class three, and this is for class four. Okay? So what you're doing is when using a neural network to predict outputs, okay, choose the neuron that gives you the largest response. Okay? And that neuron tells you what class it is. That neuron tells you what class the input belongs to. Okay? So if you have a bunch of training examples and then each example belongs to an individual class, so let's say your first training example belongs to class three, what's going to happen is that you make an expected output vector of zero, zero, one, zero. That would be the expected output for the first training example. And let's say in the next training example, the expected class was two. So you put your input in, and the expected output is zero, one, zero, zero, and so on and so forth. Okay, so each of the expected outputs will be a vector of zeros except for the class that is, it's supposed to be meant for. And then you repeat the back propagation, forward propagation stuff to train. And then when you predict outputs, you just choose the neuron that gives you the most highest response, and that's the class you choose. Okay, so remember, when you're calculating the error, because this is a vector now, you have to find the length, right? So it's half. Okay, so this is equal to a half, and then you have, you know, the uh, first feature, right? Subtract the second feature, and so on and so forth. This is all squared. Okay. Just remember that, because the cost is going to change. So you have uh, an expected output as a vector, and you also have the predicted output. If you want to figure what the error is, just subtract each of the elements individually, square them, and take the uh, and just add them all up. So this is a plus. Plus. Okay? Just remember that. Okay, so that's how you do it for multi-class. It's very simple. It's just you have multiple output neurons where each of them are supposed to detect a certain class. Yep? Sorry? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure you're paying attention. Yes. Yes. Ideally, you want the output to be that. Ideally, you want the output to be that. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Project more than one input. So far, what we've done, okay, so what, let's say you have a bunch of weight matrices and they're trained, okay, you know, you've got a point and you want to predict outputs. What we've done with so far is that you're doing it one at a time. So you take one example, put it through the actual network and see what you get. Take another example, put it through the network and see what you get. But it's, if you have a bunch of examples that you want to predict, let's say you've got like 10,000 or so, it's probably going to take a long time to loop through every single one, okay? So there's a, there's a way to do it simultaneously using linear algebra. So you can do it in one concrete step. Okay, so, so far, uh, we have only talked about uh, what happens when we predict a single example as input. Okay, so we've only talked about a single example. Okay, what if we wanted to do multiple predictions? What if we wanted 
multiple predictions. How would you go about doing that? Okay, so if you recall, okay, if you wanted to compute the inputs into a layer, it's very simply, you know, this that we had before, right? Just using matrix vector multiplication. Okay, and then finally, so we have this, and then the white matrix, right? It kind of it looks like this, right? So the rows tell you the source coming from the previous layer and the columns tell you where it's going to go in the current layer. Okay, so uh, okay. All the way down. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you remember just the individual summation, it was i is equal to zero to the previous layer. I'm just putting this in just for illustration. So this is what it was if you take a look at each individual neuron by itself. Okay? So let's, you know, uh, like, like, we, like what we had before, let's say we have, instead of just a single example, we have a matrix of examples where each row is an example and each column is a feature. Okay? So if we represented uh, our M examples, so we've got, we've got M examples coming in, okay, as a matrix of inputs, okay, so each row is an example, okay, and each column is a feature, so this is very much, or it's actually the same as what we've dealt with in the past like with logistic regression, linear, oops, is a feature. Linear regression and so on. Okay, so it looks like this. So we've got the first feature, first example, second feature, first example, up to as many features as we have. Then we have the first for the second, second, okay, and we keep going down. The last training example and then Okay, so we had a matrix of elements. Okay, so each row is an example. Okay, so let's see here. Let's, so just like we did before, we're going to append a column of ones. So let's append a column of ones. Right, and the reason you do that is to um, account for the bias. And you'll see why in a, a little bit, account for the bias. So in this case, we're going to create a matrix x hat, which is simply, okay? So this here is a column vector of ones. Okay? And then this is the original data matrix like we had before. Okay, so that's a column vector of ones. So let's look at this very carefully. So if I computed what's going to happen? So if I take this data matrix here, right? And then if I also take a look at this matrix here. Okay, so let me just copy this. Let me just show you for illustration. So here's my weight matrix. Okay? And Oopsie. Copy. Okay. If we computed, what happens? Okay. All right. So you notice that each row is a training example. Okay. And what's going to happen is, if I take each of these rows and I multiply with this matrix, what what you're actually doing? is for every single training example, you are actually computing the inputs into every neuron. So what's going to happen is when you do this multiplication, every single column, okay, will give you the outputs of the first neuron for every single training example that you have. Okay, so what's going to happen is that when you compute this matrix, okay, what's going to happen is that you get this. 
right? You're going to get a matrix like this, okay? What's going to happen is that this is, let me see here. So actually, let me just write a little prelog. Let me just, instead of this, let me just actually write a little description before I talk about what I'm doing. So let me just get rid of this. Oops. Uh, just get rid of this. Let me just write something out for you. So if, if we computed what happens, so what's going to happen is that we would get a matrix of outputs at R4. for layer L, okay? So what'll happen is that each column, uh, not layer L, we'll say layer one, not L, one, right? Each column of, okay, would be the outputs of each neuron for every example that we have. Okay, so in other words, what I mean to say is that if we decide to compute this matrix like so, what's gonna happen is that you're going to get a matrix like this, okay? So what's gonna happen is that each row will be the example, so this is example one, this is example two, and so on. M, okay? And what's going to happen is that this, this would be the output of the first neuron at layer one. Okay, so what's going to happen is that each column will tell you what the outputs of the first neuron will be at the first layer. And for every single row, it tells you what the output will be for every example. So in this case here, this would be the output of the uh, second neuron at layer one, on uh, layer one, okay? And you keep going, keep going, and then this one here will be the output of neuron D of one, which means that D of one is how many neurons you have in the first layer without the bias, of course, but neuron uh, at layer one. Okay, so every single column will tell you what the outputs of each neuron will be for every single example that you have. So each row tells you which example you're looking at, and each column will tell you what neuron you're looking at. So if you take a look at an individual row, it will tell you what the outputs of each neuron would be for that particular example. Okay, so this here is S of 1 for example 1. Okay, and then this here. Okay, will be S of two, for example, two, and so on and so forth. Okay, so when you do it by matrix vector multiplication, what you're actually doing is you're computing the inputs and finally the outputs simultaneously for all the uh, examples that you have. Okay, so therefore, we would compute S of one for every input example Okay, so each column of x of your one is not each column, it would be each row actually. It would be each, uh, each row, not each column. Is uh, s of one for each example. All right. So then what you have to do now is, so we get this matrix, capital S, okay? So we get this matrix here. So to compute the outputs, X1 for each example, all you have to do is just apply these, uh, you know, the activation function to every single element in this matrix, okay? So to compute the output of each example, apply activation function to every element uh, in 
S sub 1. Okay? So this will actually be a matrix form. So you get Okay? So then now this will search. So then all you have to do now is you just have to repeat the process. So this, then what you have to do is if you want to compute the next one, you just do x of 1 times w2. Right? So this computes that one, and then you just keep going. And then you just keep going. You repeat it until the end. And then so on and so forth. Okay, so you just keep repeating the process. So repeat the process until you reach the output layer. Actually, I'm sorry, before you do that, you have to prepend a column of ones. I'm very sorry about that. So let me just take this. Okay, so now so what we need to do now is make sure you prepend a column of ones. Okay, and then you do it. Okay, so uh, this. Okay, so this is for layer two. Uh, so this is for layer one, right? This is for layer two, and so on and so forth. So repeat the process until you reach the end. All right, so that's all you have to really do. So let me just lay out the actual algorithm for you. So the, the just, the just let's finally put this to the, you know, put this to work. So final algorithm. Okay, so what you do is zero, the very, very first step, given a matrix of examples. Okay, uh, x. Okay, so what you're going to do is the first step is set to be, okay? So you're gonna set the first input to be this new, you know, this is a column of ones. Okay, and this is the new data matrix from before. Okay, two. And then all you have to do is just repeat the process. So for layer, so for the first layer, the hidden layer, the second layer, all the way up to the end, what you're going to do is you're going to compute this matrix. So this is uh, okay, and then you're going to create the next input that's going in. So this is a column of ones, and then okay, so this is a column of ones again. Okay, and then let's see here. So a pen column of ones, pen column of ones, and then apply g of z to every element in that matrix. Okay, and then finally you're done. So then three, so output, output predictions are in the matrix X, L, okay. But you have to remove the by. You need to remove the. You got to remove the first. You know, column of ones because you don't need those. Okay. So remove first column of ones. And then what's going to happen is that this matrix will be such a way where every single row gives you the predicted output for that particular example. Okay. So each row. is the predicted values for the corresponding input example. Okay, and that's how you do it. So this is what you would do. So this is for propagation. using multiple inputs. So instead of cycling through every single example that you have, let's say you have all your training matrices, they're done, you don't need to do any more forward, you know, you don't need to do any more back propagation. 
So you have a bunch of inputs that you want to use to predict. Just make a data matrix and then just run through this algorithm. So make sure you append a column of ones. Take this matrix and multiply it by the weights so you get the inputs for every single example that you have. Uh, apply the activation function, append a column of ones, and you keep going, keep going until the very end. You remove the column of ones and then you have a matrix where each row gives you what the predicted output will be for the neural network for every example that you have. Okay, very simple. All right. Okay, so that's good. So here's uh, here's one more. Th here's a couple more things that I have, and then uh, I guess we can stop. Uh, tips are important. Okay, so I'll be able to finish this up. Okay, so here's the burning question. This actually has been a subject of debate for many many years. There's actually not an accepted answer for this question, but I'll give you tips and tricks that I have used when I implemented this stuff and what I have stuck with when I worked on this stuff. So how many neurons and, uh, and layers, oh, it's actually, how many uh, hidden, how many layers and neurons per layer do we need? So this question, I'm sure George has probably answered, asked this question in the past, is how many layers do we want and how many neurons per layer should we choose? Because so far we've just assumed arbitrary configurations like there's an input layer, there's an output layer, and then there's an arbitrary amount of hidden layers, and then each hidden layer has a bunch of neurons. So how exactly do we figure out how many hidden layers do we need and how many neurons per hidden layer we need? No right? answer to this question? There's actually no answer to this question. There is a rule of thumb that people use that is currently being accepted, but uh, it, it totally depends on experimentation. There's actually no accepted answer for this. But I will give you what I have seen in practice and what a lot of people agree on. Okay? Okay. So you obviously need one input layer. The input layer is going to accept in a training example. And how many neurons in that input layer is just going to equal the number of features that you have. Right? So for example, if you take a look at our lab, as an example, each, if you take a look at the digit classification, every image is 28 by 28, which is 784. So the input layer is going to have 784 neurons plus one bias. Okay, so you're going to have one bias plus as many features as you need to classify something. So that is accepted. That everyone agrees with. Okay, so you're going to need one input layer. Okay, so one input layer is required. That's, that's non-negotiable. Okay, so one input layer is required. Okay, so we need this, of course, right? And the number of neurons, okay, is simply the number of features you need. Okay, and then you have to add a bias on top, plus one bias. Okay? And then the output layer, it's also an accepted standard. So, so the output layer is very simple. Okay? If you're doing regression, all you need is one neuron. And then the activation function is just a linear one. Okay? If you're doing binary classification, you just need one neuron as well. If you're doing multi-class, you need n neurons, where n is the total number of classes you need. So that is also accepted. That is non-negotiable as well. Okay? So one input, so output layer. So we have, let's see here, if our performing regression, all you need is one output neuron. Okay, and the activation function is a linear one. So, linear activation function. Okay, if you're doing, if we are doing binary classification, then again, you just use one output neuron, which makes sense. That neuron will detect positive and negative. That's non-negotiable as well. Okay, so in this case, you have one output neuron. Okay, so you can either use, you know, sigmoid or the hyperbolic tan if you wish. Just, it just depends on the application. Or tan H if you wish for G of Z. And then you can threshold that way, that's fine. Now, finally, if we have multi-class classification, Some people in the class, uh, some people in the past actually just used one neuron, and what they did was 
they made the expected outputs one, two, three, or four, how many ever classes you have instead of having n neurons. So then the expected output will be one or two or whatever class that you have. And then when you're doing the predictions, all you have to do is just take a look at the final number. So it's, if it's one, it belongs to class one. If it's two, it belongs to class two and so on. And that's what would be the class that you classify with. But the problem is that the output can be continuous, right? What happens if you have an output of 3.5? Do you classify that as class three or class four? So it, people in the, in the past have tried this, but it is subject to a lot of ambiguity, which is why people use the multiple output neurons instead and choose the one that has the maximum response. That way there's absolutely no ambiguity, okay? So you can do the one, one neuron if you wish, but that actually has, has, come, it has several problems. So in, in any case, you use the multiple output, okay? So if you perform multiple class classification, you use n output neurons instead, okay? Okay, where n is the total number of classes you are classifying. So in our case, we're, when you're taking a look at the digital classification for lab two, the total number of neurons you would have is 10, you know, detecting from zero to nine, yes? Okay, uh, what happens if for multiple class classification? You have two outputs. If two, then that's saying that it's you just it's basically just the coin toss because they're equally probable. So let's say you had class one is equal to you know point nine and class two is equal to point nine. You just roll the dice and see what you get. You actually randomly choose. It's saying that it can either be one or two. They're both equally likely. So in that case, you flip a coin and choose, or you randomly choose one. Okay. Yeah, that's actually what happens. It it happens very rarely, but if you do happen to get that case. You just randomly choose one and stick with it. Because it's saying that it could be it could belong to any one of these classes. So you, you can go ahead and choose whichever you want. No, that's a good question. Yes? Good question. You assume that the activation function is uniformly assigned to every neuron. Yes. Cases in there are actually cases where there are different activation functions. Yes. It um, what that will hap what happens there, it, it it actually depends on the learning problem. Usually for a data that's very non non literally separable, that's difficult usually do change the activation function at each layer. So it is per layer, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so usually how the process works is that each layer has the same activation function, but then different layers can have different activation functions. So the first layer could be a sigmoid, the next one could be a hyperbolic tangent, like it, it depends. But you usually don't randomize the activation functions inside a layer, it actually, actually crops out pretty badly. So what people usually do is they have a bunch of layers and then each layer has the same activation function, but you don't randomize it. it just, Unfortunately, it's subject to experimentation as well. But people usually just use the same activation function player. It makes it easy, and it's actually a lot more, it's easily trainable. But it, it totally depends on your data. If you see that you know, there's, it's having a hard time converging, you might want to switch up the activation functions per layer. It just, it just depends. It's all, it's unfortunately, it's all subject to experimentation. That's also a very good question as well. Okay, so if we have multiple, n is the total number of neurons, uh, and then use, you can either use the sigmoid or the hyperbolic tangent. It's up to you. Okay, so input layer is well defined, upward layer is well defined, but what we haven't talked about is the number of hidden layers. There has been subject, this has been a subject of debate for years. There's actually not a single agreeable answer to this. But what people usually do is in practice, usually one hidden layer is good enough. For a lot of applications that use neural networks for classification and regression, a lot of people just stick with one hidden layer and it's usually pretty good. It's usually, it usually has good performance. Okay, so that is a relief. Usually one hidden layer is good enough. But it totally depends. If you see that your problem has a little bit of trouble training, then that's when people actually add more hidden, the general rule is the more hidden layers that you have, the better your performance will be but the more hidden layers that you have, the harder it is to train your neural network because you have more weights to deal with and it's actually a lot harder to train. So the computational trade-off between how many layers you have and in terms of performance is actually negligible past the first layer. At least that's what I've been told. So usually one hidden layer is good enough. Okay, so you can try more than one if you want, but you have to be careful because uh, it actually may come to a point where the neural network is not trained. That's actually, it's actually harder to train. It's harder to get convergence. You can try more than one layer. Okay. But performance.
performance increase is negligible. Okay, so it's also harder to train too. So you have to keep that in consideration. Okay, so that's the number of hidden layers. So that is what is generally accepted, but some people will disagree with this. But this is what I've seen. So that's the number of hidden layers, but what about the number of neurons in the hidden layer? What about this? Okay, so what people usually do is, let's say you have more than one input layer. Let's say you have two or three input layers. What people usually do is that they make sure that every hidden layer has the same number of neurons. That is what is the accepted standard. So you usually don't see a case where you have the first hidden layer is having three neurons and the second hidden layer will have six and then the next one will have four. Usually every hidden layer has the same number of neurons because it, it just allows it to be easily, you know, a better trainable. Okay, so if using more than one hidden layer Okay, make the number of neurons the same. At each layer. Okay, so that's that's that is what is accepted from what I know of. Okay? Alright. So the actual number of neurons themselves is subject to experimentation and also subject to debate. So there are many, as I call rules of thumb, to determine the number of neurons in a hidden layer. So what you can do is you can use these as an initial starting point and then you may have to increase or decrease the amount of uh, you know, neurons in the hidden layer for performance. What we actually will unfortunately not talk about this in this course, and I, I would have loved to, but uh, due to time constraints we can't, is there is a topic in neural networks which is called pruning. And what pruning does is that it will systematically figure, so let's say you have like, you know, usually start off with a really, really high number of nodes in each layer, and what pruning will do is that it will systematically eliminate unnecessary nodes until you get the best performance possible. So that it's called a subject of pruning, and Unfortunately, I don't have time to cover that in this course, but it's a nice topic if you want to take a look at it. It's called pruning in neural networks. Okay? So there are many rules of thumb to determine the number of neurons in a hidden layer. Uh, if n equals number of input neurons, okay, and m is equal to the number of output neurons, I've usually seen these three formulas in practice. So there's a little bit of variance between them. But usually there are, these are the three that I've seen. Here are some I've seen in practice. Okay. The first one is actually not bad. What you're doing is you're just finding the average between the number of input and output neurons. So for example, if you had 10 input neurons and 20 output neurons, the average would be 15. So that's what people, that's what some people usually do. So it's just the average between the input and the output. So we usually take the ceiling because you can't have 15.5 neurons. It doesn't make any sense. So you usually round up if you decide to calculate this. So this is the first, this is the first one, and this is the ceiling. So you're rounding up. Okay. So whenever you have any fractional, uh, you know, outputs or fractional numbers, you usually round up because it doesn't make sense to have a fractional neuron. Okay, so this is the first one. The second one that I've seen is usually taking the square root of them multiplied together and again, taking the ceiling. Okay, another one that I've seen is to take two thirds of the input neurons and then adding it with the number of output neurons. That's another one as well. So none of these are the most correct. So what you can, Usually what I've seen is the first one. I I've seen a lot of people just average between the first and the, you know, the input and the outputs and use that to start and then systematically increase or decrease to get performance, but there's no one correct answer for this. It's been a subject of debate for many years. Okay, so. 
Uh, usually, if you increase the number of neurons, you should get better performance, but at the cost of, which I'll talk about later, overfitting. The more neurons that you have, actually you're beating me to it, the more neurons that you have, the more risk that you have that you're possibly overfitting your data. And if you have a small amount of neurons, you're going to be underfitting the data. So there's a little bit of science behind figuring out a balance between the right number of neurons and not overfitting or underfitting your data. So usually this is a nice compromise to make sure that you're not overfitting or you're not underfitting, but you don't want to choose too many, you don't want to choose uh, a small amount and you don't want to choose a too large of an amount because that'll be overfitting and underfitting respectively. So this is used as a nice compromise to make sure that it doesn't happen. But that's a very, uh, that's another very good question. Yes? Um, in practice, like we've gone over on um, regularization. Yep. Would they just overfit and then regularize or did they oh. try to avoid Oh, you know what? That's, it actually also depends. Some people will try to put in as many neurons as possible and regularize, and some people will just not regularize and decrease the number. It, actually, it just depends on preference. Okay. So that's also another very good question. So me, what I would personally do is, that's good. So just try to jam pack as many neurons as you can, and then just apply regularization so you don't overfit. That's actually a very good question. So that's what I would do, but other people would disagree. They'd be like, don't regularize, just make sure you tweak the number of neurons. So again, neural networks, the, this topic has been a subject of debate for years. The, figuring out the number of neurons and measuring performance. Like, uh, there's no universally accepted answer for this particular kind of question. And that's also a very good one. That's, that's good. But, uh, that's nice for you to bring it up. None of these are the most correct. Okay, so it all comes down to experimentation, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm now uh, I'm going to I'm going to end the this class by talking about how you'd implement this in MATLAB. So I want to talk about this because I want to I want you to be able to implement this in the most efficient way possible. One way you can do it is totally through stochastic gradient descent. If you want to do that, by by all means. In fact, that'll that uh, I'm designing the lab as we speak for the for the third lab, and that's actually the first exercise is to solve the XOR problem using stochastic gradient descent just as a warm up. And then for the more complex problems, you'll be using the optimization toolbox like Fmin CG or Fmin Unc, using neural networks to be able to uh, find the best parameters. But I'm going to give you uh, some insight on how you'd use those toolboxes to implement neural networks. Okay, so here's some tips in implementing a MATLAB. Okay, so here's some tips. So I'm going to end the talk today by just talking about this. And then I'll talk about support vector machines next week. Or if I have time, I'll give you a nice introduction to it. Using stochastic gradient descent will take a long time. For a uh, long time to train, to train usually. Even though you're doing updates at every, you know, for every example, usually there is a large number of examples, so um, getting down to the optimal weight matrices will unfortunately take a long time, but you can still use those updates uh, to do predictions. So it's not so bad. You're not waiting endlessly after you know, a bunch of uh, examples. You're just waiting after one, but still, it, will, it, meant it can take a long time. So you can use either Fmin Unc from MATLAB, or you can use the uh, function that I provided for lab two, Fmin CG as an alternative, to help find the parameters. So what I'm going to lay out here is basically how you would implement this for the lab. So this is just a nice little thing for you. Okay? Help to find the parameters of the weights. Okay. So if you've started lab two, what you need to do is uh, when you're using the optimization toolbox, you have to provide a cost function that the um, toolbox will want to minimize. Okay, so what you're going to have to do here is you're going to have to implement this cost function file that will do forward and back propagation to calculate the cost for a particular set of weights, as well as the gradient update for every single weight that you have in the uh, in your neural network. So you have to implement that cost function. Okay, so we must write uh, a cost function uh, let's see 
IDE that implements uh, forward and back propagation. So back prop, I'm just gonna make it back prop. But, so what's gonna happen is that because this fu cost function is expected to iterate over all the examples because you know you have to provide a cost function that the thing has to minimize. So you're gonna have to iterate over every single example and accumulate all of the errors and all the costs and then return that to the output. So, but, uh, what is it? But we must iterate over all examples. So I'm gonna provide you the algorithm to do this. It's actually not bad, okay? So what you need to do is you need to perform the update, updates after every example, and then you need to accumulate them after every example. Okay, after every example, and then find the average, find the average update, because you're accumulating over M examples now, you're, just, you're not just updating individually, and then you do the same for the cost. All right, the same for the cost, wicked. Okay, so as we have seen before, uh, let's see here. So you're gonna need a function that will, oops, output uh, the cost and the gradient for every single weight and layer in the neural network for every weight. Okay? All right. So, recall. So this was the cost function with, so recall this was the cost function with regularization, okay? So it was one over two M, going from one to M examples. Okay, so that is the error for each example, and then you add in the regularization bit. So there's three sums here. So as many layers as we have, excluding the output, and then we exclude the bias, and we sum over that matrix. Or sum, not matrix, but we sum over those weights. And then there's a regularization term here, I forgot. And then we have, okay, so this was the cost function we needed, okay. Okay, so we've got that. Okay, so if you take, if you've used the optimization tool, what's going to happen is that the input parameters are expected to be a vector of parameters. But if you've taken a look at what we've doubled so far, the parameters are stored in matrices. So you have a set of L matrices, but the inputs are expected to be in vector. It's expected to be in a vector. So th that's a little bit of a problem. So what you need to do is you have to take every single matrix that you have and you have to stack them up so that it be, it's stacked into one giant column vector. So what's gonna happen is that you'll take your first weight matrix, take all the rows, stack them on top of each other so you get a column vector and then you put that in. And then you take your second matrix, make that a column vector and put that in right after the first one. So what you're doing is you're taking every single weight matrix, converting each of them into a column vector and then stacking them all into a single column vector that you use to put into the actual function. So that's a little technicality that you have to realize because the expected parameters are supposed to be a vector, but then you have a bunch of matrices. So you have to convert the matrices into a vector. And then once you run the routine, you got to extract the right portions of the vector, reshape them into a matrix, do the forward backward, and then put it back into vector form. So it's a little bit, little bit of a headache, but it's actually not bad. So we need uh, weight matrices. But if you use any of the optimization toolbox like fminunc or fmincg, okay, these require the parameters to be a single vector, single column vector of inputs. Okay. So what you need to do? So how do we how do we solve this? So 
So what's the solution for this? So, okay, the parameters to be a single vector. So how do we solve this? So what you do is make the cost function file, or make the cost function, pack all of the weight matrices into a single vector. And I'll show you a little diagram. I'll, I'll draw a little diagram for you so you can understand what I'm talking about here. Okay? So what I mean is the following. So you're going to have a vector W. It's going to look like this. Okay? So what's going to happen is that you have this first section that belongs to the first weight matrix, right? And then you have this section that belongs to the second one and so on and so forth all the way down to the last one. Okay? So each section is the unrolled or unpacked weight matrix that is stacked up into a column vector. So each section uh, is an, I'm going to call it an unrolled version uh, of the weight matrix for a layer. Okay? So what's going to happen is that you have to pack each one of them, uh, you know, side by side each other. So this is for, uh, you know, layer one, right? And then, so each section is on all, and then what you need to do is stack all of the rows. So that you get a single vector. then place into the right section. So that's what you need to do. Okay, so the first section, you're gonna have an unrolled version of, the, of layer one, and this is layer two, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what you do. So this is one giant column vector. So this is one giant column vector of parameters. Okay, so that's what you're going to receive, and then what you need to do after is you have to pluck out the right portions of that vector, change them back into a matrix, do your forward back propagation or whatever you need to do, and then when you're done, you have to change it so that the updates are now a column vector, and then you send it back to the output. So that's what you need to do. Okay, so one giant column vector. So let's see here. So first, so that's the first thing. So uh, this is the first thing that you have to do. The second thing you have to do is in the cost function, in the cost function file, okay, we will need uh, to extract out. This is my last topic, so once uh, once I'm done here, I'll I'll call it quits, and then I'll do support vector machines next week. Okay, so we will need to extract out the right portions of the vector and transform them into their transform them into uh, weight matrices so this step is a little difficult if you're not experienced in MATLAB so when I give you out this lab, I will write out the code to do this. So all you're responsible for is to implement the forward backward prop. So the reshaping from the vector to the matrix and the matrix to the vector, I will do for you. Okay, so I want you to concentrate on implementing the algorithm. Okay, so we will need to extract out the right portions of the vector, transform them into weight matrices, so you're going to get W1, W2, and so on. Okay, and then what you need to do after is go ahead and calculate your forward, backward, prop, or whatever you need. So calculate the cost. And gradients, gradient updates. Okay. Then pack all of these into a single vector again. And then you send this to the output. Send to the output. Okay, so what I mean by this is if we want to send an update, okay, what's going to happen is that it's going to be a giant column vector again, okay, 
So what's going to happen is you have this section. This will be the first update, right? Actually, it should be J, not E, because we're doing it over many examples. This will be for the second update. And then you keep going, keep going up until the very end. OK? So these are all the gradient updates. And how this is going to work, OK? So for example, this one, this here, this is usually, a, this is, uh, what is it? It's a D0 plus 1 by D1 matrix, right? So what's going to happen is that you're going to take all the rows and stack them so that they're one big giant vector. And then you're going to throw them in as the first portion of that vector. So what's going to happen is that need, you need to make a, what is it? D0 plus 1 multiplied by, okay, by one vector. So, so let's say your weight matrix was, let's say, 4 by 6. So what's going to happen is that you're going to take each of the four rows, stack them on top of each other so that it becomes a 24 element vector, and then you place this in the first 24 elements of that update. And then you just keep going for the rest of the layers until you're done. Okay? And so on and so forth. Okay. So now that you have that technicality out of the way, let me write you the pseudocode of what, how you'd implement this function. Okay? So pseudocode. So this is basically what you would new, use for uh, pseudocode for cost function. This is what you would implement in the lab when you finally get down to it. But I'll get you to do stochastic gradient descent first to solve the XOR problem, and then I'll get you to do this for more complex, you know, more complex uh, situations. OK, so how, are you how this is going to work? OK. So usually the header looks like this. Uh, so we have. Uh, okay, so if you've taken a look at lab two, you have to create a function where the first output is the cost to evaluate at the particular, those particular set of parameters, and the second output is the gradient vector, or the, the uh, gradients that you use per parameter that you have. Okay, so, okay, so we have x, y, and then params. So let me just outline what each of these are. So this one is the cost evaluated uh, using current parameters. Okay, so that's this guy. And then this one here is basically, it's a vector of all of the gradient updates for every single weight that we have and every layer that we have. So for all layers and weights as a vector, as a column vector, I guess. Okay, and then this guy here, this is the uh, data matrix that we have. You don't need to prepend the ones here like we did before because we're going to do that inside the function itself. So this is a data matrix of training examples, much like we have before, okay? And these are the expected outputs. Okay, the expected outputs, uh, expected outputs uh, for each example. Okay, and then this guy here, these are the weight matrices that are stacked into a single vector. Okay, so weight matrices. Stacked, or these are the weight matrices of the parameters stacked into a single vector. Okay, so that's what the prototype or the, the function header is going to look like. Okay, so we have this, and then here's basically the pseudocode. So starting off with the first step. So what you're going to do is right off the get-go, you have the vector of parameters that you're dealing with. So the first thing you need to do is extract out the right portions of the vector to reshape it into getting the weight, the desired weight matrices. Okay. So I will do that for you in the code because it's a little, it's a little difficult if you're not familiar 
uh, with MATLAB. So I will do that for you, and then I just want you to concentrate on implementing the actual algorithm itself. So sample the right portions uh, of the parameter vector, and so I just have to do this SOTICO, then I'll, then I'll let you guys go, and reshape them into the white matrices. Uh, W1, W2, and so on. So you need to sample the right portions of this vector and transform them so that they are the weight matri matrices that we're, you know, that we're used to dealing with. You're going to set the cost equal to zero, right? Because what we're doing is we're just doing one epoch or one iteration. And then what you need to do is we're going to initialize weight matrices. So we have a set of white matrices that we have, and then this will store the updates that we need to send, and so on and so forth. Okay. So basically, what these are here, these are the gradients at each layer. So what I did here is I just took the white matrix and I just multiplied it by zero. So that way I, ha I initialize a matrix of zeros that's the same size of each white matrix that I have. So the gradients at each layer. Uh, initialize as zero matrices. Okay, and then here we go. Here's the main algorithm. All right, so for i equals one, two, all the way up to m, and this is as many training examples that we have, so number of training examples. Okay, so what you need to do first is you have to take each example and then um, send it to the input layer. So I'm also assuming that the input's randomly shuffled. I'll talk about that later. But uh, OK, let me just put the caveat in here. So assume examples are randomly shuffled. And I'll, I'll help you do that as well at the very beginning. Examples are randomly shuffled. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is to initialize the input layer to be the training example of interest. So the first training example, second training example, and so on. And then what you need to do next is you have to compute the four propagation. So given an input, you have to do the four propagation, get the um, inputs and outputs of each neuron. Okay, so for L is equal to one, two, all the way up to L. Okay, so this is... X. Okay? And this is just for propagation as we saw before. Okay? So here, this step is for prop. Okay? And saving XL and SL for all layers. Okay? That's the forward propagation step. That's pretty cool. OK. So that's the forward propagation step. The next one is you have to compute back propagation to get the uh, updates. right? So actually, before we do that, remove bias from the final, input, the final output. So this is the first element. OK. So that's all forward propagation. Okay. So now what you got to do next is you got to do back propagation now. So the next step here, right, is compute, actually, sorry, let me just yeah, compute sensitivity. Sorry, I'm going to do black, not gray. It's not really noticeable. Compute this, right? So uh, yeah, and this is, oops, and Okay, so that's the first step. And then the next step after that is for L is equal to second layer, second hidden layer, no, second last, third last, all the way down to the first one, you compute the rest of it. So this is G prime uh, L, right? And then 
This is from before. Okay. Okay. So this stuff here, this this step over here, this is back prop. Okay. So that's back prop uh, to find sensitivities. Okay. And then finally, let's see here. So we have the next step. Okay. Is to compute the updates. So for uh, all the layers. Okay, what we need to do now is get the single update for this particular example. So this is x and then plus. Okay, this is putting regularization in just, to, just to, as a nice little bonus. And I forgot to uh, times uh, this guy. And then let me move this this way, plus. Okay, all right. So this is find gradient of example i. Okay, and then finally, what you need to do is you have to accumulate. So accumulate gradient and cost. Okay. So in this case, we're going to have, so for each layer that we have, what you're going to do is you're going to accumulate the cost. So this is update. Uh, notice that we're just calculating the gradients. We're not doing stochastic gradient descent. So you just have to accumulate all of the uh, updates. And then what you need to do is you need to multiply by 1 over m times, okay? The reason why we do 1 over m is because it actually builds in the average. So when you take each training example and multiply you know, the gradients by 1 over m, when you accumulate all of them, it's actually the same as finding the average. So there's no next step that you need. So this is the grade, and then finally what you need to do is you need to update the cost. So that is plus, and then Actually, uh, sorry, let me just go back up. The regularization, where is it, where is it, where is it? Um, where did I put it? I forgot an M somewhere here. Okay, my bad. So if you take a look at the regularization term here, I have to, I have to average it over all training examples. So this is alpha over 2M. Apologies, I forgot to put that in. So it's 2M and then I need to correct where the heck did I put it. I need to correct that all the way up here. So where is it? So it's one training example, and over here I forgot to do M because I'm doing I'm, I have to find the average, All right? So M. Sorry about that. So there's an M here, so that's very important. It shouldn't really affect it as much, but um, it's, it l l let it converge. So in this case, we have okay, and then so you have this, and then let's see here. So you have that, and then. Um, then you add in the estimation of all the weights. So, uh, let's see here. So, uh, half over 2m, uh, j, and then, okay, and then this is after. So, this stuff here, this is after update. Okay, so that's what you do if you wanted to implement regularization in. So you have this, and then finally we are done. Okay, so last step, and then I'll let you guys go. This is the last step. Okay, so take uh, each uh, gradient update. So this guy here, okay, for L is equal to one, two, all the way up to L, okay, and place into the output vector grad, because grad is the output vector of the cost function, so you have grad equals uh, so what I mean to do is you gotta unroll this. Let me just move this down. 
unroll each matrix. Again, I'll do this. I'll do this step for you because it's a little difficult if you're not ex as experienced. So, dun, 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 dun. so this is right, until so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what you return. So this, oopsie, I'm almost done. I'm just gonna write a couple more notes and we're good. So this here is gonna be a Z0 plus one times D1 by one vector, okay? This here will be a D1 plus one, D2 by one vector and so on and so forth. Da 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 da. Okay, so this is what you would need to implement if you decide to use a MATLAB's optimization toolbox to help you. So this is the final algorithm you'd need, and then that's pretty much what you'd implement. So you can either do it stochastic gradient descent like I talked about before, or you can implement it like this using MATLAB's optimization toolbox. Okay, I'm done. So we'll talk about some more vector machines next week in time for your lab, and then I'll talk about uh, common advice that you use for machine learning problems to be able to get them to work successfully. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.